people, most people who were Japanese Americans and who came to our camps in 1942, they have a particular story. Uh, one of the reasons that you see the picture of Dr. Young over there is because Dr. Young played a vital part in bringing about their coming to Park College. And let me mention, while we're talking about Dr. Young, that his nephew, Larry Young, is here. Larry, would you raise your hand? Mm -hmm. uh, several of those people are no longer with us, but uh, some of them are. <coughs> and uh, I asked three of them to uh, be uh, part of the program today. So first of all, I would like to introduce Messiah and Miguel Nakamura to tell us her part of the story of what happened in her life and its relationship with Park College in the 1940s. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Can you hear me? Uh, first of all, we flipped a coin, and I lost, so I'm <laughs> I didn't want to be first. I wanted me to go ahead of me. But, uh, and, uh, but I lost, so I'll, I'll have to be first. Um, I want to take you all back to uh, June 1941. I don't know what you were doing, but I was graduating from Roosevelt High School in Los Angeles. And I was very excited because now I was going to have a chance to go to college. And I had been accepted at UCLA. And uh, I was really grateful also to my parents because they were allowing me to go to college. So many of my friends, my girlfriends, uh, couldn't go on to college because their parents felt that uh, girls shouldn't go to college, but uh, the sons could go. My father had me first, my sister next, <laughs> so uh, I guess he thought, well, since those two came before my brother came, uh, if one of them wanted to go to college, uh, he would say yes. So he backed me all the way, and uh, I decided that uh, uh, at that on June that night uh, when I graduated from Roosevelt that this was a great opportunity for me and I was very excited. Sad at the same time because I knew then that I was opening a new chapter in my life and uh, many of my friends would be going off in different directions and perhaps I would never see them again. So I uh, immediately looked for a job as a schoolgirl in Beverly Hills. Uh, so that I could help uh, finance my college education and also so I could be close to UCLA. We lived in East Los Angeles and that was quite a commute and we couldn't afford to, I couldn't afford to live in a dormitory uh, or go into a sorority. Uh, they wouldn't accept me anyway. <laughs> so uh, I did get a schoolgirl job one block down from where Gary Cooper lived. And I worked more, but I never did see I walked by his house many times, but I never had the, uh, the opportunity to see him. But I worked for a lawyer and his wife, and uh, I, a schoolgirl did some housework and helped with the cooking, and I also tutored their son in algebra. That wasn't my field, but I, uh, he really needed help. <laughs> and uh, I helped him with uh, algebra work. Uh, when I got to uh, UCLA, it was it was wonderful. It was a huge campus. The uh, lecture halls were filled with students. It was so different from high school. Hundreds in the lecture hall, and it was a real new experience for me. And uh, I wanted to get into the whole college life, and so I uh, joined the freshman council. I decided that I would be as active as possible on campus, as well as trying to learn something academically. Uh, December 7th, 1941, I shattered my dream. 
I had to uh, withdraw from school because there was a law that uh, prohibited Japanese Americans from being, I think, eight or ten miles from home. And of course, UCLA was much further than that. And there was also a curfew, an 8 p.m. curfew. We couldn't uh, go out of sight of the home after 8 p.m. And I remember I had a very good Chinese friend, Mildred Poon, in high school. And she would come over during those days, and uh, she said, let's go to a movie sometime. I said, well, I can't go after 8 o'clock at night. And she said, well, I'll tell you what. In those days, the Chinese Americans, to distinguish themselves from the Japanese Americans, wore a button that said, I am Chinese. <laughs> uh, and uh, so she, she said, I'll let you borrow my sister's button, and then we can go, and nobody will know the difference. And I, I thought for a minute, I really want to go to the movies, but then I said, no, I, I can't do that. I can't, uh, you know, uh, become Chinese for one night, and I can't uh, do that to my family or to myself. And so I, I uh, didn't go to the movies with her. Uh, shortly afterwards, in February, on February 19, 1942, President Roosevelt signed an executive order that stated that all persons of Japanese ancestry would be evacuated from the West Coast and interned in the camps. Uh, they were going to relocate us to 10 camps, permanent camps, uh, they were located in very desolate areas of the country, Arkansas, Wyoming, Arizona. Lower Arkansas. Yeah, Colorado. There were some very, very um, uh, places where there weren't any other people around. So they could kind of hide them, I guess. And these were being built, and in the meantime, we were sent to um, assembly centers, temporary assembly centers, uh, close to where we lived. And uh, we lived in East Los Angeles, and there were so many Japanese and Japanese Americans living in the Los Angeles area that they had to divide it into the zone, and they evacuated them uh, zone by zone. And we were the last zone to live. Uh, we knew when we had to leave because there were posts with signs on the telephone poles around uh, where we lived stating that we had to get ready to meet at a certain place on a certain day with two suitcases. Everybody could take two suitcases that they could carry, nothing else. And uh, I remember my sister and I packing, repacking, and wondering what to take. We didn't know where we were going to go. Uh, should we take warm clothes? Should we take cool clothes? Should we take, uh, well, whatever. And um, finally, we, I had a lot of books in my suitcase, and finally I had to take them out because my mother said you have to take practical things like a new toothbrush, and sturdy shoes, and things like that. And so uh, we were uh, getting prepared. We were among the last to leave. We didn't know where we were going. Um, my father, However, at first, when the order, before the order came out, and after I had uh, left uh, UCLA and had gone home, <coughs> he said to me, because I was the oldest one in the family, he said, you're an American citizen. I don't think anything will happen to you. You have your rights as a citizen. And uh, I don't think that they can take away your civil rights. I, I, something can happen to me that I'm still in, in Asia because Japanese immigrants could not become citizens until 1952. That was way after the war. My father wanted to become a citizen. He came over here as a young student, went to the University of Washington, and he planned to live in America, become an American citizen, but he never could. My mother was born in Hawaii, and she was an American citizen. So she married my father, and when she did that, she lost her citizenship. <laughs> so they were both uh, alien as far as um, uh, the United States government was concerned. So he told me that since I was the oldest in the family, that after he was taken or whatever happened to him, I would have to take care of my sister and my brothers. And I was terrified because I was only 
70 and some time, I said, what am I going to do? You know? And so I was rather relieved when uh, February 19th, the executive order came out saying, all people of Japanese ancestry, citizens or not, if you had one-tenth Japanese blood in you, you were to be evacuated, uprooted from your home, and taken to these camps. And although that's a terrible thing to plan for, I was a little relieved because now I could go with my mother and father, we could go as a family. Um, when uh, we gathered at uh, our church, that was the departure point for our <coughs> Union Church in uh, Los Angeles. As I said before, I didn't know where we were going to go. They gave us numbers, um, numbers to identify us. Each family had a number and we had a tag attached to our clothing then. And we boarded these buses, and the bus driver said, pull the shade stuff, pull the window stuff. So we couldn't see where we were going, uh, and they didn't want people in the streets to see us either, because there's quite a bit of hysteria at that time, a lot of propaganda, and anti-Japanese sentiment was really at its high point. And since uh, at that time, in the early stages of the war, of course, Japan was winning. And so there was a great deal of uh, hostility uh, against the Japanese community and Japanese Americans and our parents, uh, since we looked like the enemy. That was our only, I think that was the only reason they evacuated us. They told us that it was for military necessity and that it was for our protection. But actually, when we got to the camps, the soldiers who were guarding the camps were pointing their guns at us. Not apply, not protect us. They were pointing their guns at us and they were up in their towers. We ended up at the Santa Anita racetrack. <laughs> and uh, I had, uh, there were more than 10,000 of us. And Pete was there. I didn't know he was there because there were thousands of us there. Pete was there. Willie was there. Toki Kumai was there also. I knew Toki was there because she went to the same church I did, and I would see her uh, as she lived around our area, like in our block. We had blocks in the camp. Um, the first people who went to the camp lived in the horse stalls. Pete, did you live in the horse stalls? Okay, in the horse stalls. <laughs> and I can remember thinking, oh, am I glad I don't have to live there because you could always you know, smell the, the former occupants. You know, all, <laughs> always there. And no matter how much you scrubbed and tried to get it clean, you could still, that smell was there. And I felt sorry for them. And I was so happy we were at least in the barracks, the re very crudely constructed tar paper barracks. Uh, hundreds of them lined up in, in the middle of the racetracks. And, um, the first day we got there, they passed out these burlap bags that told us to fill the bags with straw for our mattresses. Uh -huh. And uh, it, we, I, I think that um, I really uh, looked on that portion as, a, as an adventure, and it was kind of, uh, it was not like uh, uh, something so serious. I, I guess I wasn't sophisticated enough to realize what was happening, that as an American citizen, I really had the right to protest and that my civil rights were being taken away from me. Um, my parents, they accepted this old order uh, because they accepted it. They weren't citizens. They, they felt that they had to uh, go quietly and also to obey all orders. And since we just followed along with our parents. I know when I told uh, my story to my children years later, because we couldn't talk about this for a while. I don't know whether it was because of shame or humiliation or what, but we just tried to think of, keep it quiet and just go on about our business uh, of life. But when I told my, my son about it, he came home one day from his high school class and said, Mom, I heard something about you went to camp during the war. And camp, to him, he was like a Boy Scout camp or girl scout. <laughs> camp, you know, what was camp? Why? Why did you have to go to camp? And so I had to explain to him. 
and he wrote a paper for his history class and the teacher didn't know about this either and she read it and she passed it around and I remember that uh, he was very happy that he had chosen that topic because he got an A on it <laughs> and that he was but uh, we couldn't talk about our students for the longest time. Um, my parents uh, didn't talk about it, and uh, I guess uh, we were too busy trying to uh, recover from it or whatever and to go about our lives. So we didn't talk about it to our children until they began to force them to talk about it. And uh, now I go around to the high schools, the junior high schools in our area, and speak to the students let them know what happened because this is not in the textbook. Just recently they have started to put in some a few paragraphs about this experience in the textbook. But before a few years ago, no one some people who lived in the East and the Midwest really didn't know that that happened, that 120,000 Japanese Americans and their parents were removed from their homes and uh, interned for four years in camp, uh, various locations in the country. Um, I went uh, to camp with the idea that I was, I'll never be able to go off to college. Now, uh, I didn't know what was going to happen, but my father heard about this group that was trying to get students out to colleges in the Midwest, church schools in particular, who were accepting students. Uh, and so we uh, investigated and I was able to get a permit to leave the camp to come to Park College. And uh, Pete and Willie and Toki left before I did. I guess they got their permission slips before I did. And I got mine late, so I had to leave by myself. And I remember the day I left. This army truck came to get me, the three soldiers, in the back and I had to get in the back of the truck with them and we drove through Los Angeles to Union Station on that truck and people were staring at me and pointing their <laughs> fingers at me and I felt like I was going to the guillotine or something. <laughs> with these soldiers with their bayonets there and here I was huddled in the corner. Got to Union Station and they turned me over to this conductor and he escorted me to this car and put me on and I got on and I noticed there wasn't a single empty seat in that car. And so I turned around and I said, uh, are we supposed to move on to the next car? There aren't any seats here. And he said, no, you stay on this car. You sit right down here, <laughs> right in the front of the car and wait until there's a vacant seat. So I just sat right in front on my suitcase and the, it was so still in that car and everybody was staring at me and I, I could just feel the tension and this hate and, and I could hear whispers of jab, jab, you know, she's jab and all that and I really felt rather uncomfortable and at that moment I began to feel a little sorry for myself that, that I had decided to go on to out of camp and uh, I was uh, sitting there and uh, listening to this, with these comments, and uh, the conductor came through to collect the ticket, and uh, I handed him my ticket, and he grabbed it out of my hand, and he spit on me, and when he did that, I was so shocked, you know, I, I, I just, I, I was angry, shocked, bewildered, ashamed, humiliated, you know, all these emotions. And I really, I, I was so shocked that I couldn't even wipe the spit off my face and I could still see what trickling down when I think about it. I couldn't talk about this for the longest time. Uh, I never told my parents because they would be really sick. And on top of that, they were going to be in the trials on their own. I never told my parents or my brothers. And uh, I first started talking about this to a high school class to ask the train, you know, when you were on your way to the college, and that's when I talked about it. And it was very difficult for me uh, to talk about it the first time, but now I, I, I 
wept when I first talked about it. But uh, uh, since then, I have been uh, telling people about what happened on the train because something very good happened after that. Um, I was sitting there feeling pretty miserable, wishing that the uh, hole would open up so that I could fall through. And when, when he spit on me, um, there was a gas in the, in the car. <laughs> but the witnesses were awakening to my face. And I was just told that this was misery. And about two stops before Kansas City, this young couple got on the train. I noticed they got on the path. And a few minutes later, as I was sitting there, I felt his hand on my shoulder. I looked up, and the young lady was looking down at me with a kindest look on her face. She said, why don't you come and sit with us with an empty seat right in front of us? Why don't you come and sit with us? So those are the kindest words I had heard in a long time, and uh, I got up immediately. <laughs> with them and started talking to them and uh, the train pulled into Kansas City and I was still talking to them and I almost forgot to get off. <laughs> in fact, they had to remind me that I was supposed to get off and they had forgotten to do it because we were so involved in our in conversation. And I remember getting off and walking uh, up the ramp and there was uh, Art Kaminska and uh, Dr. Young training they thought maybe I had missed the train or they didn't know what had happened to me but they were very relieved when they saw me walking up the ramp and um, they greeted me they said you know all the students at Park are waiting for you you're going to get a very warm welcome I didn't tell them about my experience with my friends um, and uh, they, they uh, and uh, Art said yeah it's really great we really want to love it here and uh, Dr. Young said, but, you know, the townspeople aren't so happy about you being here. And, uh, in fact, they were uh, threatened to lynch you if you go down to the town. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, he said, so, uh, I'd like, to, whenever you go down to the town, be sure that you go with your roommate or with somebody else. Don't ever go down by yourself. I won't go down uh, unless I have something with me. We got to the college. I met my my roommate, Eloise Todd, curly blonde hair, blue eyes, cute perky girl, and uh, we got along fine from the very beginning. And uh, I remember when I walked into the room and I saw the bed. <coughs> A real bit. <laughs> <laughs> After a couple of months on that tape after, a real bit to sleep on in a real room, you know, with the chair, with the chair and a bed. And uh, it really, uh, it, it, I was so happy to be there. And, uh, and the students welcomed me so warmly. And I went out and I looked at that beautiful campus the next morning. Uh, beautiful green. And it was just like paradise after being in that <coughs> black truck over <coughs> barracks, walk, uh, barbed wire uh, camp. And uh, I remember that fall, uh, the tree were in college, and I had never seen anything like that in California. And I would stand out and just look at all, at all the beauty. And uh, all the fireflies. I thought that they were unreal. I thought they just appeared in fairy tales. You know, and it was just, just I, I just loved uh, the surroundings and, and the people and the fact that it was a small college where I could get to know everyone. The teachers knew who I was. I knew who they were. It, at UCLA, uh, the professor didn't know me for Adam. You know, they, I was just a number to them. But here at college, I was able to take the youth who I was, and I I knew who they were, and it was a, a wonderful experience for me uh, here at college. I think I uh, really grew up to on that train ride, and after I got, I have to tell you that the time I've been downtown. Um, after a while, I got tired of asking people. 
people to accompany me. And I thought, gosh, you know, I should be able to, they're not going to harm me. People, people are, are good. They're, they're not going to harm me. Just a short, short, uh, 18 year old, uh, 100 pound, someone walking down the street. They think it's possibly so. One afternoon, I decided I was going to go down by myself. And uh, I broke my promise to Dr. Young. And I um, walked down, and I saw two young men sitting on the bridge. The bridge. And they were looking at me, and my heart started to pound because of this what a foolish thing I'm doing. But my pride kept me from turning around and going back up the hill. And I thought, well, I'm going to walk by them, and I'm going to smile <coughs> and, and say hello and see if they'll respond. And, and, try, and my knees were shaking. I could hear my heart pounding, and I thought I was going to faint, but uh, I did. I passed by them, and I, I think I saw. I don't know what I did. <laughs> and, 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 and they got off the wall, and they started following me. And I thought, oh, should I run? Boxing. You know, they have longer legs than I do. They're bigger. Well, what shall I do? Shall I cross the street? I, I really didn't know what to do. I was in a panic. But I tried not to show it. And uh, I, I kept on walking. And I waited for the post office. And uh, they walked in right me. And I walked up to the window. And I said, uh, I'd like to buy some stamps, please. Uh, I've run out of stamps. And I've been writing letters to my friends. Here. And, uh, and the lady behind the, the window said, ah, you speak English? <laughs> <laughs> yes, uh, I'm an American, and that's the only language I know. And she, she kind of stood there with her mouth open. She gave me the stamps that I paid for them. And I turned around, and, and those two uh, young men kind of made a for me. And I walked right by them, went up to the campus. Uh, after I got back to my room, I guess somebody saw me and snitched on me. The doctor got called me into his office, and he really, um, uh, really tore into me. <laughs> he said, "Did you realize what you did? You you put the whole college in jeopardy. If something had happened to you, we would have been blamed for it." And I really felt terrible, but I told him, yeah, "I couldn't help it. I have to do it." You'll have to forgive me. I broke a promise, but I just had to do it. And you know, he was a wonderful man. He understood. And um, after that, I didn't have any problems. Um, just to give you uh, a little uh, idea of what conditions were like back there and before, I told some of you last night about the videotape I produced for the uh, exhibit which was shown at the Oakland Museum in 1990. It was called Strength and Diversity, and it was about a hundred years uh, of Japanese American women in the United States. And it was a very successful exhibit. And, uh, it, and the Smithsonian traveling exhibit saw it, and, and now they, uh, it's a part, the exhibit is a part of their traveling museum. And last night, I asked uh, some people if they knew where Logan, Kansas uh, is. Uh, that's where the exhibit is supposed to be now. And it's there until uh, Saturday, uh, until tomorrow. But nobody seems to know that there's a Logan, Kansas. So I don't know. It's between Phillipsburg and Gordon. There is a Logan, Kansas. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, <laughs> But anyway, it, it's been there for a couple of months. Uh, it's been all over the United States and Hawaii. I think it's going back to the West Coast down to Portland, Oregon. But it's going to be traveling for about two more years. And um, this tape that I made for the exhibit uh, is a 10-minute tape, and it was an introduction to the exhibit of artifacts and different uh, things that represented the lives of Japanese-American women uh, in within a hundred years of 1895 to 1995 or 1990. And I brought the tape and, and, and I made it to set it up in my, in my monitor and the VCR. 
and um, I think you can get a little taste of what it was like uh, in the camp and also before the camp. Uh, the narrative for this uh, tape is uh, excerpts of poetry written by Japanese American women. And we decided we wanted to do that rather than to have a straight script. Mm -hmm. When people ask about my mother, I look away and say, Oh, she's been gone a long time now. I hardly knew her anyway. But I know she was a renegade. Why else was she standing on some foreign shore, uncomfortable, in high-heeled shoes and black dress with bus starts, her cherry blossom kimono left far behind? How else did she consent to trade her rice paper walls for corrugated tin and to love, honor, and obey this crude stranger, Ito-san, who sipped Coca-Cola through a straw? Yes, my mother was a renegade. She braved the future by swallowing her pride. How can I say this? My child, my love is nothing. There is nothing to tell. My family in Japan was too poor to send me to school. I learned to sew. Always I worked to help my family. When I was 17 years old and no one made a marriage offer, a friend in our village who was going to Hawaii a picture bride said to me, come with me. I did not want to. My parents did not want me to. My picture was sent to a stranger anyway. A young man's photograph and letter came. I was already 17 years old. I went to the island of Hawaii to marry this photograph. so many dreams with us over the ocean. The cane field. You cannot imagine the walk. With dirt cracked fingers, my mother wrote her name over and over again on the alien brown soil where strawberries grow. Straightened her back wiped her sun-browned face. She had worn her work like lemon leaves shining in her sweat. Driven by her dreams that honed the blade of her plow. And then, all was hushed for announcements to be incarcerated for your own good. At Pearl Harbor, my ancestors and I became enemies. The deaf heard me shout that I was I, and not my ancestor enemy, but which was which was hard to tell. We surely looked alike. To the lady, the one in San Francisco who asked, why did the Japanese Americans let the government put them in those camps without protest? Come to think of it, I should have run off to Canada, should have hijacked a plane to Algeria, should have pulled myself up from my bra straps and kicked them in the groin, should have bombed a bank, should have tried self-immolation, should have hauled myself up in a wood frame house and let you watch me burn up on the six o'clock news, should have run howling down the street naked and assaulted you at breakfast by AP wire photo, should have screamed bloody murder like Kitty Genovese. We were told that silence was better, golden like our skin, useful like Go quietly. Easier like, don't make waves. Expedient like, 
horse stalls, and deserts. I spent 547 sulking days here. In my own dreams, there was not much to marvel at, I thought. Only miles of sagebrush and lifeless sand. I watched the most beautiful sunsets in the world and saw nothing 40 years ago. The trick was keep the body busy, be a teacher, be a nurse, read some, write some poems. But the mind was not fooled. him depart that day from the tedious wall of wire, the humps of barracks, handsome in his uniform. She did not remember reading about his death, only the wall of wind that encased her as she turned her head. Strongest prisons are built with walls of silence. My mother merely shakes her head when we talk about the war, the camps, the bombs. She won't discuss the dying, her own, as she left herself with the stored belongings. She wrapped her shell in kimono sleeves and stamped it third-class delivery to Tule Lake. This wall of silence crumbles from the bigness of their crimes. I claim my place in this line of generations of women. Lean with work, Soft as tea. Mother, grandmother, speak in me. I claim their strong fingers of patience, their hurt, their longing, the sinews of their survival. Yes, I'm alive because of memory and my own tongue breaking free. Yes, we are growing in numbers with great diversity. We will teach you how to tell us apart. Our histories will be told loudly.
talking about Dr. Takatoshi Peter Gore. And Pete, would you come up and share a little bit of your thoughts and remembrances? Yeah. Our 50 plus years ago. <laughs> Hard out to follow. <laughs> <laughs> oh, he Another Nisei fellow was uh, fourth for the rank singles player. And we were preseason favorites to win our conference. Well, of course, that never happened. But we, our team finally did come pretty close to winning, but without myself and this other fellow who had to go into camp, uh, the team just got squeezed out of our big championship, I found out. Well, my hometown was split. Uh, all those who lived south of a certain street had to go uh, to Santa Anita one month before the people north of, of that street went about a month later. And uh, uh, I, I really didn't believe that uh, this uh, uh, trip was going to happen. Because I had gone to uh, <laughs> Japanese language school uh, uh, when, in, in my youth, uh, we would go to public school, and then I think uh, three times a week, Monday, Wednesday, and Fridays, we used to go to Japanese school to learn Japanese language. And uh, I remember back in 1940, some of the older um, Niseis uh, coming back to Japanese school and telling us that uh, they were in the military intelligence back in 1940. And uh, so I asked them, what, what, what were they doing there? And they said, well, uh, the Army, uh, you know, the Armed Forces of the U.S., they were preparing for war with Japan. So back in 1940 here, these days were already serving in the military <laughs> as intelligence. So I, I thought, uh, they were internalists. <laughs> but uh, I guess, uh, uh, but the day after Pearl Harbor, a lot of the uh, business and social leaders of the Japanese community, uh, the FBI, what the so-called dangerous aliens, you know, were in interned to a federal prison in Missoula, Montana, the day after Pearl Harbor. One day I, c I came home from high school and my mother said, uh, Dad was uh, taken away today. And the only reason that they took my father, uh, this was uh, uh, two days after Valentine's Day, my, my, my uncle and my father were in the nurse, wholesale nursery business. So we had just got to uh, visit Valentine's uh, um, period. And uh, so when I came home and mom said that uh, father was taken away by the FBI and the local police force, and the only reason he was taken was because in uh, September of 1941, my father finally agreed to serve on the local uh, Japanese school board. All these years, he had said he was too busy. And so here he was, he was on the school board for three months. And uh, that was the reason the FBI came into the room with. I guess they figured he was one of the lesser 
dangerous aliens because they sent them to Santa Fe, New Mexico. <laughs> and uh, fortunately, uh, one of our good friends in town was the local American Legion commander. So we got him and one of the leading lawyers in town and our uh, personal family physician to uh, uh, appeal to the, uh, uh, well, the Western Defense Command, which uh, incarcerated my father. And uh, uh, like in, we were uh, put in San Diego racetrack in the, I guess it was the end of March, about one month later than Messiah. <laughs> but anyway, my father was released uh, after about three months in federal prison in Santa Fe, New Mexico. So he came back to uh, Santa Anita, yeah, and I think it was in late June of 42. And well, as I said before, I was hoping to, to get a tennis scholarship, but I knew that for a while <laughs> that uh, my getting a tennis scholarship was now. And how well, he, he just going to college, I thought, I was, I was out of the question now. I was, uh, when Pearl Harbor was, uh, uh, that, I was 16 then. And my birthday was uh, in February, so I turned 17 in February. And here, uh, all these talk about internment started. And, uh, finally, we did get interned. And here, I was uh, in Santa Anita. And I didn't know that my, uh, uh, we had a Japanese club in, at the high school. And the biology teacher, she was the advisor to our club. And I didn't know that she was working in my behalf to uh, find a uh, college for me to attend. And I had never heard of Park College or anything, so I didn't know uh, anything. And I didn't know that this advisor was, uh, I had met with Dr. Young and so uh, I guess it was some early summer, I guess, when I found out that uh, uh, Park College uh, was going to uh, accept us. And, uh, I know uh, Masai and Toki Kumai, and I really, we were the four that from San Diego that we were supposed to go. And I, I don't know how Masai didn't go to uh, Park College with the rest of us, but Okay. Uh, anyway, uh, we got to Park College, and uh, I remember uh, uh, Willie and I got off the train in El Paso. We wanted to get off the train to send a wire to Park College to tell them that we would be arriving in Kansas City Union Station the following evening. So the, uh, when we got off the train, this great, tall, big uh, Texas Ranger, you know, he was a giant. Uh, I mean, he, he, he must have been at least six feet, six feet uh, four or five. And in those days, the Texas Rangers wore these steps and hats. So that made him look even taller. Not like this, uh, not like this short guy you see on TV, you know, Texas Ranger. I said, that's not a Texas Ranger. <laughs> Anyway, he, he stopped us and wanted to know what we were doing in uh, El Paso, so we told him that we were going to college, and we showed him our travel permit. He said, okay. After sending the ride to park, we uh, got back on the train and arrived in Kansas City the next evening. And the first person that we met uh, from our college was Kingsley Gibbons. <laughs> yeah. And the next day after we arrived on campus, uh, Art uh, Kamitsuka and Dave Dohi and Hank Masuda, they were already on campus. They said, you know, the town, some of the townspeople are going to, said they were going to shoot us. <laughs> so I said to myself, gee, what, how did I get myself into this kind of situation? They you know, wanted to shoot us. But then, of course, nothing came of that. And I don't think anybody warned me about going downtown by myself. Maybe because you were 
you were a girl, yeah. Well, we, we didn't have any uh, problems now in Park Bay. Uh, well, uh, I, I was uh, thinking that, uh, you know, before going to college, uh, it would probably be at UCLA or some big school like that. And I never thought that I would end up going to a small little college in the Midwest up there like Park College. But uh, I think I, uh, one of my letters to the uh, our class, uh, as it, when I was a class agent, I guess I was a class agent for uh, at least 10 years. And, and one of those I, I wrote in there, you know, what, what uh, Park College uh, meant to me. And, and why I thought the class of 45 to support the college. And, uh, well, uh, I had a great time for a lot of good people. Uh, in fact, uh, I didn't know how to dance when I got here. <laughs> and uh, uh, Jim Crockett, uh, I hope I'm not going to embarrass Miss uh, Emily Davis' great question, but uh, she taught me how to dance. And, uh, uh, I remember uh, Sadie Hawkins' study. I guess it was uh, <laughs> the first one. I remember uh, the, the girls could ask uh, boys for a date. And this girl, she was a real cute blonde. Remember Jean Krantz? Krantz? She was a freshman. Even. Anyway, she called me up for a date. And I didn't know who she was or anything. And uh, anyway, uh, uh, that was Teddy Hawkins. That was the first Teddy Hawkins. The second year, they had this thing uh, on the soccer field where uh, the girls chased the boys, but you had to stay on the soccer field. And, 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 and the girl caught you, you had to go with her to the City Hawkins stand. But I at the time, uh, I had already learned a little bit about you know, how to dance. But then, uh, I, I can try to remember, was there a Peggy Shannon? Who? Peggy Shannon? No, this was a tall girl. Yeah. She was so cool, a six-footer. <laughs> 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 Chasing me all over the field, <laughs> and I was going to get caught by this tall girl. And, uh, and then I think she conspired with uh, another girl. They tried to trap me, but uh, I, I kept running. And, and, and so, but, but then I got so tired that some, some, somebody else caught me. <laughs> that was one of the experiences at Park that uh, was kind of unusual. <laughs> Uh, uh, but it was a lot of fun at Park. Met a lot of real good people and made a lot of friends. Uh, one of the things that uh, I was sorry we didn't mention about the evacuation was that uh, our family was fortunate that we had an employee who had been working for our nursery for a long, long time, since high school days. And he uh, took over our business during the war. We were lucky. We didn't have to sell anything. We had to store some of our things, but they, this, uh, this fellow and his family moved into our house and walked, looked over the nursery during the war. And a lot of families were not so fortunate. They had no time to you know, it, it was such a short period when the, the edict came out to, to be interned that uh, a lot of the uh, families uh, had to quickly sell a lot of things. I mean, most of the Japanese were uh, truck farmers or flower blowers, and you can't, you know, sell some, something like that in a short time. So some, some, some of those people really had to make uh, a lot of the financial sacrifice selling me things that real cheap because they didn't know what was going to happen. Uh, well, I, I think that's about it. Uh, since Messiah covered the internment thing so well that uh, there isn't much more for me to say except that uh, 
Park College gave me a great education. I know one, one course that I always, uh, when I look back on, really helped me was the Humanities Service. Yeah. I don't know if, uh, Masada, you probably didn't have to take that when you were a sophomore, but all, all the freshmen had to take the Humanities Service. But that was a great course. And, oh, one thing, yeah. Uh, my senior year, last year at Park, I finally had enough guts to go up for the uh, Park College Choir. And, uh, and that really uh, has influenced my life. Because I've, I've sung in church choirs for over 40 years now, and, uh, and I also have sung with our company, uh, Choral group for 10 years. And that's been a big part of my life. Uh, I never intended to go for a PhD in chemistry. Uh, I had in mind that I would uh, get a, at least a master's, maybe, and maybe teach somewhere, uh, either high school or college. And, be a tennis coach and a basketball coach. For those of you who know me, I've always been interested in sports. And uh, when this war came, I said, oh, there's no opportunity for a Nisei coach anywhere. But actually, one of my good friends who uh, graduated from the local high school about three years before I did, he, he did finally go back to the old uh, school and became the head football coach there. So uh, if I had followed my original plans, I probably could have done the same thing, but I took another uh, way and ended up uh, uh, with an advanced degree in chemistry. And, and what, what, one, another thing, when I was growing up, I used to listen to this radio program uh, sponsored by the DuPont Company. Of Wilmington, Wilmington, Delaware, near the slogan of better living through chemistry. <laughs> I never did realize that uh, I would end up in Wilmington, Delaware. Not for a DuPont company, but for another company. And, uh, Mark, did you say something? No, I guess not. <laughs> well, I think that's funny enough. <laughs> Another one of your classmates, Dr. The Reverend Dr. Arthur Kavitsika, had hoped to be here for his 50th reunion this weekend. He's still active in the uh, Presbyterian Church, the men's uh, movement, has gotten into interdenominational work, and today he's in Seoul, Korea, in an interchurch men's religious uh, meeting. But, uh, he sent me uh, a statement about his experience. Let me share just some parts of that with you. Here's what Art said. Abe Dohey and I grew up together and attended the same high school. Hank Masuda grew up in Los Angeles. The three of us enrolled in Reedley Junior College, about 25 miles from Clovis. We were glad that we were able to continue our college education. We spent weeknights, Monday through Thursday, in Reedley, and after, on class, and after classes on Friday, went home to Clovis. On the last day of exams, which I recall being in the gymnasium, I handed in my papers to one of the several teachers who were collecting them. The teacher I gave my papers to, a teacher I did not know because I did not have classes with her, made me pause, and she started to ask some questions. She seemed to know that there would be movement shortly. Her last question, if you had the opportunity to go to a college in the Midwest, where would you like to go? Californians rarely thought of going to college in the Midwest. <laughs> East Coast, possibly, like Harvard, Yale, Columbia, or Princeton. But she kindly asked the question, so I responded. The only college I knew about, as ads appeared in the church school paper that we received each Sunday in Pittsburgh Beach, I blurted out, Park College! <laughs> she seemed surprised but happy, but that was the end of it. Only a week or so later, an order came for us to be at the railway station at a certain hour with the only bags that we could carry. We were corralled into the train. The windows were blacked out. We soon were headed somewhere, but the destination was not known to any of us. Some hours later, eight to ten hours, we were ordered off the train. 
We soon saw rows upon rows of barracks. There were three camps, each with the capacity of housing 10,000 people. The camps were separated and soon were given names. This is June in the deserts of Arizona. The first camp was at Poston, as that was the name of the village. The second was called Toasted, and the third was called Roasted. It was at least 110 degrees plus by mid-noon, and we were assigned to Toasted. <laughs> then only a month and a week or two later, I received a telegram saying, quote, Would you like to study at Park College? All expenses provided. Signed, Dr. William Lindsay Young, President. Dr. Young had done all the homework. He knew that our assets were frozen. He sent us the train tickets and some money for meals. But out of the blue to receive this kind of telegram was, to say the least, overwhelming. My parents and uncle strongly urged me to accept the invitation. I don't remember if the telegram to me included Abe and Hank's name, but only a week or so later, the three of us were off to Kansas City. As we neared Kansas City, we began to wonder how we would get from the station to the college, or who would meet us at the station. With luggage in hand, we sat in one of the benches for a seat and to rest. Fortunately, our train arrived in the morning. After only a few minutes in the waiting room, we saw an elderly, respectable gentleman with a warm smile heading toward us. Uh, I turned around to see if there might be some others seated near us. <laughs> But we were the only ones. With a friendly, outstretched hand, he said, Welcome to Kansas City and Park College. My name is Crockett. I have come to take you to the college. We couldn't believe all that was happening to us. Mr. J.D.M. Crockett, a member of the Westport Presbyterian Church, which Dr. Stuart Patterson was president uh, was pastor, soon became Dad Crockett to us. He was Jim Rippey's grandfather. I believe he was also an auditor of the park and the College of the Ozarks. I'll never forget the warm welcome he received from faculty, students, and staff. Spencer Cave seemed to sense what we might have been experiencing, and his kindness was most assuring. His folksy philosophy taught me much. For example, he said, Arthur, there are two seats we should dust every day. Conceit and deceit. <laughs> we had to be careful in the early months when going into town, and there were a few unpleasant experiences, but there was not a single unpleasant experience on the campus. Dr. and Mrs. Young were generous in sharing their time with us, and their inspiration continues to this day. Dr. Young stood for justice and inspired many others. Castles in Spain was the title of the first sermon I heard Dr. Young preach at the opening chapel service of the 1942 academic year. It was based on the Apostle Paul and his letter to Christians in Rome, even while he was in chains, that he would be visiting them en route to Spain. That was a message embodied in the life and mission of Dr. Young that will never be forgotten. On this 50th anniversary of the graduating class of 1945, and others who were in college with us between 1942 and 45, I want to thank you for your generous friendship and love. My roommate and classmate, Jim Robinson, who served on the National Board of Presbyterian Men during my tenure as Executive Secretary, has joined the company of the committee. He was my brother in Jesus Christ. And this is what Art commits at the end to say.
play, which they write and act themselves, which is called Acting Beyond Prejudice. And uh, she uh, will be discussing that program, and she has a video of this year's production, which again was, was quite effective. And I think you would enjoy it, and I will tell her we've run a little bit late, and that maybe she could uh, begin her program. It's now 2.30 when she was to start, but I'll tell her that I'm hoping some people will be on the way. I will take a motion to adjourn. No debate. Meeting adjourned.